dear learners greetings from iit guwahati we are in this course advanced thermodynamics and combustion and in the first module that is review of basic thermodynamics we have three lectures the first lecture we covered on temperature and zeroth law of thermodynamics today we are will uh, we will be discussing on the uh, first law of uh, thermodynamics and which is mainly dealt with work and heat transfer and in this lecture number 2 uh, which is work and heat transfer that is first law of thermodynamics we are going to discuss the following topics uh, the first one is the basic concepts of work and heat then we'll move to the thermodynamic de definition of quasi static process and subsequent work transfer then we'll move on to generalized equations for work system and uh, subsequently how that work equations can be applied for a composite systems involving multiple number of systems and processes Uh, which are non thermodynamic in nature then we'll uh, after discussing the concept of work and heat we'll give the uh, definition of the first law of thermodynamics and with this first law of thermodynamics it gives another concept which is heat transfer or heat which is uh, and it is the another form of energy subsequently uh, to this Uh, discussion on the first law of thermodynamics we will define some parameters and that which is heat capacity uh, and and its measurement uh, and the last segment of this uh, topic is the modes of heat transfer now let us move on first we will give the thermodynamic definition of work and heat uh, we all know that uh, the energy interactions in a thermodynamic systems can occur in two modes work and heat and there are some basic definitions which needs to be followed if we if you, if you want to dis, uh, talk about work uh, in mechanics principle work is nothing but force times displacement and later on we uh, uh, convert the work to energy subsequently it can be kinetic energy potential energy so sticking to that definitions the thermodynamic sense of defining the work refers to the fact that whenever we define this work it and side by side we can visualize that systems either rising or falling a mass systems so in the process of rise and fall of this certain mass the potential energy of the system is changed and that gets transferred in the form of work so in this work transfer mode in one sense we say there is a paddle wheel arrangements which is used to change the thermodynamic state of the systems and in this case it may be a liquid inside a container and that thermodynamic state is going to change through this paddle wheel arrangement and when you do some work on this paddle wheel uh, and that is possible through rise and fall of this mass systems a similar work can also be introduced into the systems through an electric circuit in which we can uh, add uh, we can dump the work into the same amount of work through an electrical system but still that also can be used that energy can be used uh, or view can be viewed as rising and rise and fall of a mass systems now in this process of the change of energy energy interactions we really do not encounter the change in the temperature substantial change in the temperature if this is not the case and whenever there is a energy interactions by virtue of temperatures then that systems we refer as a heat transfer mode 
So, in uh, same systems, uh, we can say that in a closed environment, a certain mass of liquid is getting heated by a burner. There is uh, another uh, uh, viewpoint is that we can have a electric systems in a uh, enclosed container in which the water can be placed. So, this particular uh, sense there is no uh, physical movement of mass systems. I mean these systems cannot be viewed as a rise and fall of mass systems rather it can be viewed as rise in the temperatures. So, in the this category we say there is a temperature change delta t is involved in this case also delta t is involved, but so, so that is what they call it, they fall under the heat transfer heat as the mode of energy interactions. But in this case we have uh, the work transfer can be viewed as m g delta z in this case also m g delta z. So, delta z is nothing but the elevations which can be quantified in the form of rise and fall of weight. So, this weight can be when it goes up it does work on the systems when it comes that means work is done by the system. Having said this definition of work then we are we are going to discuss about two uh, form of this work one is external work other is internal work. So, in the internal internal work systems that means this is mainly applicable for a microscopic system where there is interaction of atoms, molecules, electrons and in that case if the analysis of work when it is done uh, so that work is done by one part of the system to another part then it is a internal work. But if a system as a whole exerts a force on the surroundings and the displacement takes place then the work is said to be done either by the system or on the systems and it is termed as external work. So, that means unless and other otherwise specified our viewpoint of work is always external work and our viewpoint of heat is the part of energy transfer between the system and surroundings by virtue of temperature difference. Now, with this basic definition we will now move to individual uh, mode of analysis that is work transfer. The thermodynamic definition of work transfer always refers to the fact that uh, when there is a change of state from one to other then the uh, process can be spe specified as a quasi static process. So, in a quasi static process what happens that means change of state of the system happens without any disturbance to the surroundings. So, in uh, to, to have such quasi static process possible what we need to have requirement is a thermodynamic equilibrium between the system and the surroundings. So, this is possible only when uh, this um, there is uh, the system exists in mechanical equilibrium that means, there is uh, there is no on uh, unbalanced force. The system is in the thermal equilibrium with respect to surrounding there is no virtue there is no transfer of energy by virtue of temperature difference and in fact, there is also no chemical uh, reactions. So, by virtue of which it becomes uh, the system is in equilibrium chemically with respect to surroundings. If these three conditions are satisfied then uh, and the change of state happens then we say it is a quasi static process. So, all the viewpoint of analysis of work transfer can be possible through quasi static process. Now, again for heat transfer situations we can recall our previous analysis that transfer of heat is possible uh, only when the system uh, the uh, multiple systems they are separated by diathermic wall. Uh, so, diathermic wall means the information of between the systems can be propagated through heat transfer, but if you put an adiabatic wall there is no question of uh, 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 transfer of heat 
uh, or energy in the form of heat. So, these are the viewpoints in which we are going to discuss the more details on the work transfers. Now, when I say quasi static process, the first basic definition we say that uh, uh, the work is nothing but force times displacements. Now, here the force can be interpreted in the form of pressure, displacement can be interpreted in the form of volume. So, that means, uh, um, whenever that, that means there is a change in the volume and there is a change in the pressure. So, we can define this in the coordinates PV diagrams. So, that is what we say the quasi static processes are often referred in the pressure volume diagrams. Uh, so, in a simple systems like we have a piston cylinder device. So, uh, uh, and um, this piston is moving uh, uh, back and forth within this cylinders. So, the, in the process of moving uh, we can view the systems that when uh, the, the gas which is in, in inside this container or this inside the cylinder it gets compressed when the piston go moves in the forward directions and the gas gets ex, gas expands when the piston moves in the backward directions. And we say that if there is an the process occurs in very slowly so that the displacement can be represented in the form of dx small displacement for a given force f, then we can view this entire uh, change in the pressure and volume of the gas in which we can uh, write that which gas which is at initial state i, its coordinates are uh, specified as p i and v i and when this is at final state is final volume is v m v v f and final pressure is p f and initial uh, press, uh, pressure is p i and initial volume is v i. So, the work transfer in this process we can see there is an increase in the volume and here the uh, this is a, so you can say it is an expansion process and uh, in another another uh, view point is that from the final system to initial system uh, this is, um, the process can also occur. So, uh, so, these two first and second they are referred to processes. Now, when I club them together that means a gas uh, goes from the initial state to final state in one path and in, again it returns to the initial state in another path. So, these things we can say if this case this happens we say it is a cyclic process. And uh, very specifically we can say that the uh, these processes can be defined and, uh, and when the uh, in such a way that when the pressure remains constant, so it is isobaric process, when volume remains constant it is a isochoric process. Then we also uh, know that what is an expansion process, that means in the expansion process the work is generally done by the systems and in the compression process the work is done on the systems. Another point I would like to emphasize the fact that the pressure volume diagrams uh, which normally represents the work transfer is also called as an indicator diagram. So, in the same philosophy we can find out uh, uh, what is the work transfer that happens. Uh, so, starting from the first basic definition the when a force is exerted displacement takes dx the work transfer since if you can see this is an inexact differential because uh, it depends on the path. So, d w can be written as p a dx a dx is nothing but the volume change and uh, they can be integrated once you know this relation between pressure and volume. So, we can say work transfer it can be integrated from uh, P d V from when the volume changes from V i to V f and in one case the work transfer will be negative and in the other case that means, this is a situation for compression 
and this is the situation for expansion. In the process of work transfer, the volume increases. Now, moving further, this is another uh, angle of representing this uh, pressure volume diagrams, where the standard way of representing this uh, pressure volume relations as P V to the power n is equal to constant. So, in the basic thermodynamics course, this is a very fundamental relations and for different values of n, we can uh, say what are the nature of the processes. They can be isobaric, when you have say isobaric process, that means it is a constant pressure process. So, in this case n is equal to 0. So, the here the pressure is constant and when you say isochoric process, the volume remains constant, that means n is infinity. And if you say isothermal process, we say P V to the P V is equal to constant, that is nothing but P V is equal to R T. So, n is equal to 1. When you say adiabatic process, n becomes gamma. And when you have polytropic process, so typically there is a standard number, we say it is n is equal, it is just a number n, it we can be any value between 1 and gamma. So, this is how we define these thermodynamic processes uh, in our analysis. So, for each case it is now possible to find out the work transfers. So, isobaric process pressure is equal to constants. So, accordingly W 1 2 can be calculated as P into V 2 minus V 1. For an isochoric process, so P d integral of P d V is 0. For an isothermal process, we say P v to the is equal to C and since we have a another relation P 1 V 1 is equal to C. So, this particular equation can be integrated. So, there are two forms. So, work transfer is equal to P 1 V 1 ln V 2 by V 1 or P 1 V 1 ln P 1 by P 2. Now, if it is an adiabatic process P v to the power gamma is equal to constant, polytropic process P v to the power n is equal to constants. So, in this that processes the general definitions we can write as W 1 2 as P 1 V 1 minus P 2 V 2 by n minus 1 and finally, this can be represented as P 1 V 1 by n minus 1 whole into 1 minus P 1 by P 2 to the power n minus 1 by n. So, this is for polytropic process. Now, when n goes to gamma, so this becomes adiabatic process. So, this is how we are going to calculate. Then moving further, we are going to uh, have another definition which is adiabatic work. Adiabatic work, the word adiabatic is normally used when there is no heat transfer, but work transfer when the system changes from uh, state 1 to state 2, the work transfer is possible. So, in a situation when there is no heat transfer, how adiabatic work can be uh, calculated. So, uh, this particular things uh, we can say that if you recall our P V diagram. So, a system goes from initial state I to final state F. So, a typical or uh, maybe one, one of the best processes that is process 1, through this process 1 it can go from one state to other. And there are multiple ways that st point state point 1 that initial state we can reach to the final state by multiple ways. So, I can go in one line, I can pro have a pro another method um, by involving process 3. So, I can go from I to a then A to B and B to F or I can uh, have another process I to C then I to D then F. So, in this way you can say this different name of the processes we can have 1, 2, 3. So, uh, there are 3 situations that I have mentioned here in which the initial state can be changed to the final state. Now, in this process of going from initial state to final state, what I am imposing a condition is that 
we can view this as if there is a gas that changes its states when the piston moves within the cylinders. So, through this we can go from I to F, but there are some situations and in this process what I have mentioned is that this is a constant pressure process, but there are some situations that if by without maintaining the constant pressures I can choose this path and reach the final state and while moving in this route still I ensure there is no heat transfer. Now, while choosing another path to uh, that is I, C, D and F, I also see that there is no uh, heat transfer. That means, entire route is completely enclosed uh, by an adiabatic wall for which there is no heat transfer. But ultimately, if you are we are able to see or do some experiments in which we can find out a parameters and which is nothing but its internal energy, which is nothing but internal energy. What it says is that and that this internal energy I am calculating at the initial stage as well as the final state. And what has been seen is that whatever path you choose as long as that path is adiabatic the internal energy change is equal to the adiabatic work. So, means that if I go from 1 to f in the process 1 which is adiabatic I calculate what is u i that is u f. So, so, for the process 1 we can say this adiabatic I f for process 1 becomes u f minus u i. And if I am also possible it is if it is possible to also measure what is I f which is in the process 2 and I calculate this internal energy I also have same value u f minus u i. And in the third process we if you have this work transfer by adiabatic process it becomes u f minus u i. So, what it means is that as long as the condition of adiabatic nature is ensured this change in the internal energy is nothing but the adiabatic work done. So, this is the fundamental conclusion that we get out of this exercise. Now, when I say internal energy then you put another definitions what is this internal energy. So, quantitatively it is the it is the difference between the functional values between the final state and initial state of the systems. So, uh, the mathematical definition we can say it is a functional values between the final and initial state of the systems and because of this reason instead of giving a value we call this as a internal energy function. Why we say function I will come back to that point later, but the physical interpretation tells is that that increase in the internal energy function is equal to the adiabatic work and this is the basic definition for conservation of energy. In fact, when this conservation of energy uh, was in the beginning it was realized they it was started with a concept that finding adiabatic work and then equalizing it to internal energy function. So, moving uh, very specifically we can say that in the viewpoint of graphical representations we see that the u the internal energy is a state functions. Although we come to a different route the work transfers in all the cases are equal, but when it this work transfer when you trans find this equal try to equalize it with the energy transfer this we say this internal energy d u it remains same for all the uh, adiabatic path. And then it is stated that internal energy is a um, state function. Here I again like to emphasize why we say it is a function. 
since internal energy is a thermodynamic variable, the ideal way of representing them is in two, in, in two independent variables. Uh, these two independent variables could be either pressure volume or temperature volume because pressure volume they are internal related, internally related. So, the ideal way of telling this that in the first expressions if you say that u is a function of uh, uh, temperature and volume then exact differential di function d u can be specified as do, do u by do t at constant volume into d t do u by uh, do v at constant temperature into d v. Now, if you say this internal energy function of temperature and pressure then d u will be equal to do u by do t at constant pressure into d t do u by do p at constant temperature into d p. And because of this reason we say that uh, uh, the internal uh, energy has a functional relation. Then moving further we are now able to discuss about internal energy, we are now able to discuss about uh, work and we have tried make a cor correlations then we have a concept of generalized work. So, the generalized work which is nothing but the thermodynamic definition of work and for an hydrostatic uh, systems the pressure and volume representation is the most ideal way and this pressure represents the generalized force in the intensive coordinates where volume is the generalized displacement. And the third parameter which is also important is nothing but the another independent parameter that is temperatures. Uh, so, a single equation exists so that two coordinates are uh, independent. We also know that a composite systems can be depicted by two simple two hydrostatic um, systems separated by a diathermic wall that ensure both parts are same temperature. Other way we uh, of looking at the system, this composite systems can be separated in a uh, adiabatic wall. Uh, through this diathermic wall, there is a information of propagation of, in, of energy in the form of heat. So, this particular thing shows that uh, we are now uh, imagine, a, we will now imagine a si systems in which there are two gas system phase and these two gas systems are separated by a diathermic wall and, and in the both sides there are pistons. The other part and on the top of this we have a heat reservoir uh, through which the information from, uh, from this uh, one, the, uh, the part 1 that is gas in the system 1 and between the system 2 is uh, possible through this uh, heat mode. That means, if we can say it is this is a diathermic wall and this is an adiabatic wall, so even though you put a heat reservoir, we cannot uh, propagate the information between these two. And but we this entire information, but if you, you do not imagine this to be an adiabatic wall, entire information can be routed through this diathermic wall. So, what through this process now one sense we can imagine that as if we will put no restrictions on this top part in which this heat reservoir is kept. So, only information that can be passed from uh, uh, system 1 to system 2 uh, is through this diathermic wall. Initial conditions of this gas in the system 1 will be P V and initial conditions of the system uh, 2 will be P dash and V dash. So, now, now it, it is a composite systems which involves the coordinates that is pressure, volume uh, uh, and temperatures. And since we say that there is no restrictions of adiabatic in nature, entire systems can be in the thermal equilibrium. So, when I say there is a thermal equilibrium that means there is um, temperature is constant there. So, in this there is uh, there is a boundary in which there is a constant temperatures. So, uh, 
entire five coordinates although you have a multiple composite systems involving their five coordinates out of this only three independent coordinates are possible that is b b dash and t b b are related p dash b dash are related so out of this out of them we are only choosing one and temperature is the another parameters now if these three things can be plotted in the in independent axis systems coordinate axis systems that is temperature volume volume v dash and volume v and what we can realize we can imagine it's a cube involving these coordinates and and for each uh, plane we can assign some the thermodynamic definitions for example in this plane in this particular plane we will have volume constant in this top part of the plane that is we have temperature constant and in the third part of the things we have v dash is equal to constant and as you say there is no work across this boundary so that uh, boundary can be imagined as a typical isothermal process and constant uh, uh, volume process that means when you say constant volume process obviously there is no work the straight line ray b represents the process in which no work is done by the system so the a b system represents there is no work because along this line there is a uh, volume remains constant so this is how we are going to realize a composite system analysis now having said this composite systems then again we will move back to the fact that we uh, we are looking at a situations when this work transfer is possible in a non adiabatic processes so non adiabatic processes involves heat transfer because that, that that is another part of uh, mode of energy interaction that is which is called as heat so it's a, it so it is a non adiabatic process one typical example can be given that again we have same piston cylinder systems where heat is added and we relax the conditions of adiabatic so it's a non adiabatic process and if you try to quantify in this non adiabatic process what is the change in the internal energy and what is the change in the work transfer and in another situation in a magnetic field also when there is a strong magnetic field uh, which is uh, experienced by a liquid helium gas we may see that there will be change of temperatures of this liquid helium uh, uh, some of the liquids may also evaporate so in some those situations where the adiabatic conditions cannot be ensured then we say it's a non adiabatic systems and if you want to try to quantify the work transfer and uh, uh, internal energy transfer we see that this adiabatic work is not equal to the change in the internal energy functions so this gives a definitions or concept which says that the difference in the energy uh, mm, uh, follows the conservation of energy we says that the difference uh, temperature difference and the of the uh, allows the energy interaction between the system and surroundings in the form of heat and then with this we will now move on to the uh, definition of first law of thermodynamics so what it says is that for a co closed systems for which the systems are at Uh, different temperature on which the diathermic work is done uh, then the energy transferred by the non mechanical means is equal to the change in the internal energy uh, uh, and the diathermic work so this gives the formulation of first law which says which signifies three aspects first is existence of internal energy function second one is conservation of energy third one is heat as a energy in transit by virtue of temperature difference so based on that if we recall this our understanding the change in the internal energy functions is quantified as the difference between heat and work transfer and here we must 
follow one particular sign convention that this sign convention which says that heat is positive when it enters to the systems and it is negative when it is leaves the systems. Similarly, work is positive when it leaves the systems in that sense we, call, we say it is a work done by the system and the work is negative when it enters the systems. In that sense we say work is done on the system. Now, with this basic definitions we are now going to uh, talk about the, um, uh, the definition of first law of thermodynamics for a very infinitesimally small processes in which we can represent the internal fun energy function as an exit, inter exit differential du and the path functions are represented by dw and dq which are inexact in nature. Now, if you want to equate them we can say for an hydrostatic systems dq let me when is hydrostatic it is just a pressure volume system we say dq is equal to du plus pdv now if it is a composite systems that means uh, there are uh, non pdv work non pdv work involves work transfer by electrical circuit work transfer through a magnetic field so this is um, an equivalent amount of pdv work it is represented as p dash dv dash so, in a composite systems involving multiple uh, method of work transfer can be represented and for which the first law is written as d q is equal to d u plus p d b plus p dash d v dash. Then the first law of thermodynamics gives the best very basic definition of heat and we will now move, try to quantify how we were uh, going to evaluate this heat. So, for that we say we define a term called as heat capacity and how we are going to measure it. So, heat is nothing but ca uh, a calorie. So, uh, prior to this uh, development of uh, um, work the when the heat people used to view as a heat they call it as a calorie they use the word calorie how many cal calories of uh, heat has been transferred. So, uh, in, in a sense that this calorie uh, is also used as the uh, unit of heat, but subsequently after the development of the first law when it was realized heat and work they are uh, nothing but different names associated with energy then the concept of heat definition got changed. So, we say that both has same unit, uh, but the way uh, or viewpoint is different. Now, whenever there is a change in the temperature difference, the energy exchange is uh, will take place in the form of heat and in a hydrostatic systems, the if the diathermic boundary is such that the volume of the system does not change then heat exchange is the nothing but the change of internal energy. Now, in the process where when the pressure of the system does not change. So, in a case that either it is isobaric process or open systems the change heat transfer change is or heat transfer is known as the change in the enthalpy. That means, uh, uh, enthalpy and internal energy they are the very basic definition of the first law which is applied for a closed systems and open systems. We also found out that within an adiabatic boundary the heat lost uh, or gained by the system A is also equal to the heat lost or uh, it gained or lost by the system B if the boundary if the A and B are separated by a adiabatic boundary which already we have proved. Then having said this then we define this heat capacity 
for a non adiabatic process we can represent as a internal energy capacity. So, heat capacity is generally referred as internal energy capacity. So, when heat is absorbed by the system, the change in the temperature takes place depending on the states and one way of quantifying them is representing this heat in the form of specific heat that means change of heat per unit mass. So, and for a fluid systems, there is only one uh, specific heat which is defined as a average specific heat C and this average specific heat by definition we say that when the systems goes from final state to initial state, we can say uh, it is average heat capacity which limit T f to uh, T i d q by T um, that is equal to d q by d T. So, this is the definition of average heat capacity. Uh, now, if this heat capacity can be represented in the specific forms, we say small c is equal to c by n, n stands for number of moles, which is related to the mass of the systems and molecular weight of the uh, gas. So, this particular definition also holds good only holds good for gas part. Okay. Then some very other basic definition is that the heat capacity can be negative, can be positive or infinite depending on the process that undergoes the heat transfer. Now, we are going to give some mathematical interpretation of this first law by including this heat transfer. So, we have we know what is the heat capacity now we have the first law of thermodynamics, then let us correlate and we also know the mathematical relations when a thermodynamic parameter is specified as the function of any other two independent parameters. So, with these three viewpoints, we have to now recall that what we understand is that how these properties or what I mean how this uh, internal energy functions can be uh, found out from the first law. So, you recall our thought that we have a specific heat at constant volume that means, when there is a change of heat with respect to temperature when keeping volume is constant we say specific heat at constant volume. When there is a change of heat with respect to temperature keeping pressure is constant we say change, it's a, it's specific heat at constant pressures. Now, with these two definitions and we now recall the first law of thermodynamics which is d q is equal to d u plus p d v and it is a non adiabatic process. So, when we have said this then we start our definition saying that uh, let us uh, see that what is this internal energy u we can write them as a independent function of temperature and volume. So, first we assume that u is a function of temperature and volume, then we can write what is d u is equal to dou u by dou t at constant volume into d t, dou u by dou b at constant temperature into d v. Okay. So, uh, then uh, we can write this dou u by dou t uh, and we can put it in this first law equations. So, from this we can uh, find out d q by d t as a function of u d u by d t at constant volume plus d u by d v at constant temperature plus p into d v by d t. So, basically you divide by d t here the d t will get cancelled and d v by d t will come here and then you put that equation in the first law then uh, when this equation is put in the here we are we arrive at this particular equations. Here from this equation we now recall the parameter what is called as volume expansivity beta is equal to 1 by v dv by dt at constant pressure. 
Then we also have the C V definitions which is d q by d t at uh, constant temperature d q by d t at constant volume when you impose this condition as constant volume this parameter will go up. So, you this first law expression becomes a uh, which is nothing but the specific heat at constant volume. Then you impose the condition that when we write this particular first law equation at constant pressure. That means, when you say what the constant pressure conditions you if you impose that thing then uh, if you rewrite that equations then we will find that this d q by d t at constant pressure is the C p this term becomes C b and this term remains as it is and this d v by d t we can get it from the volume expansivity so, that is nothing but v, v times beta. So, finally, we have another expression d u by d v at constant temperature is equal to C p minus C v divided by v into beta minus p. So, what I am trying to gain from this exercise that we have this internal energy functions u and this u if you want to see this variation of u means you want to measure d u by d v at constant temperature it is possible that through the information of C p, C b and beta they are nothing but the property. So, through these things it is we are able to quantify this term. Another one is d u by d t at constant volume this is nothing but your C v. So, what it says is that the internal energy functions by definitions we can uh, uh, interpret it in the from the first law uh, uh, about the change of internal energy with respect to the independent uh, property parameters and in this case it is volume and temperatures. Then moving further to the heat, uh, heat capacity and measurements we have another concept which in the basic thermodynamic courses we used to um, call as a heat reservoir. So, the word reservoir stands for the fact that as if uh, whenever there is a uh, change of temperatures when you take out any heat from a reservoir a heat reservoir as if its temperature do not change. This something we can view you can if you want to take some bucket of water from a ocean or river we do not view any change in the ocean systems uh, as, as the um, change of mass. Similar way for heat concept of heat reservoir is utilized where we can say that heat reservoir by definition is this infinite source of heat from which we can take out heat or we can add heat. This heat reservoir concept is very vital in understanding the, uh, uh, the subsequent law of thermodynamics that is second law of thermodynamics. Now, from the first law principle we can find out that what is the or we can find out what is the quantity of heat that gets transferred if uh, by maintaining constant pressure then we can write it as Q p as integral of T i to T f. C p d t. So, that we can say C p times T f minus T i at constant volume Q v is equal to C v times T f minus T i. So, this is the quantification of heat in terms of temperature difference. Now, after giving the very basic definition of work transfer, then we will see that what is the modes of heat transfer. So, we said that temperature difference is the essential requirement for transfer of energy in the form of heat. But uh, uh, the, we can say there are uh, multiple phases of substance that occurs heat can be transferred in a conductor or in a solid body heat can also be transferred is possible in a liquid medium or in the gas, gas medium. So, based on this 
medium we define them in the form of uh, heat transfer as its modes. So, the first mode is nothing but the heat conduction. So, it is referred uh, as a conduction mode of heat transfer when the transport of energy uh, is possible uh, from one volume element to a neighbor, neighboring volume element through this temperature difference. So, it is a heat conduction. So, it is a volume is taken as one parameters. The Fourier's law of heat conduction is introduced that talks about this uh, he, um, that talks about this heat conduction mode. So, it is represented by equations d q by d t is equal to k a d t d a d t by d x, where it introduces a term which is called as thermal conductivity. And this thermal conductivity and also the, the, the change of heat with um, rate of change of heat is proportional to the area surface area and the temperature gradient. So, there is a term which is negative sign in, induced because the T d t by d x is always a negative quantity because uh, it flows from higher temperature to the lower temperature. Now, to make this entire quantity positive a negative sign is introduced. Now, from these basic definitions we can find out what is the thermal conductivity of a particular material and its SI unit is represented as watt per meter into Kelvin. Now, moving further when the medium is liquid we call this as a mode of heat transfer as convection or it can be also be a gaseous medium. So, the convection uh, means that by virtue of temperature difference the a convection current is introduced that means uh, for example, when you boil water what happens we are giving heat at the bottom surface of the container. So, temperature drops when the temperature uh, sorry temperature increases but density drops. So, by virtue of which the higher density mass will come down and the lower density mass will go up through this process uh, uh, the, the communication of heat happens. And as long as this goes and the um, as long as we are supplying heat we say that this particular motion we call this as a convection current. Now, if this convection current is possible naturally that means, without involving any uh, um, external agency or it can only occur through this temperature difference then it is a, a natural convection. So, if the convection current is produced by an external agency like running a fan or pump then we call this as a forced convection. So, in a heat convection there are two parts natural convection and forced, uh, forced convection and all for all this case the parameter which is of importance is the convection coefficient h. So, d q by d t is represented as a is equal to h into a into delta t where h is the convection heat transfer coefficient a is the surface area and delta t is the temperature difference. So, the convection co coefficient depends on many factors like nature and geometric configuration of the wall, uh, nature of the fluid, property of the fluid, specific heat, nature of the flow whether it is laminar or turbulent also the thermodynamic process evaporation, condensation or condensation or scale formations. The last part of uh, heat transfer study we call this as a heat radiations. Heat radiations also occurs for as a temperature uh, difference, but uh, this th there is no thermometry concept is introduced. So, it is it means when the temperature it does not fall in the range of gas thermometry. Uh, so, in this case the uh, the radi and in this case it is viewed by uh, the radiation waves and typically we call them as a electromagnetic waves. These electromagnetic waves falls as a radio waves, microwave, infrared, 
visible range or ultraviolet range, X-ray and gamma ray and they differ in frequency and wavelength. Then while talking about the radiation, we uh, characterize that it, this radiation as radiant power. So, this radiant power is termed with respect to radiation existence, which means that it is the, the radiation power that exists from an infinitesimally small surface when it is divided by its area is termed as radiation existence and it is or simply r and it this value of r changes with temperature for example for a material like tungsten the r value is 6.5 kilowatt per meter square when the te when its temperature is 1000 degree kelvin but when the temperature increases its value changes temperature increases to 2000 this number uh, um, r value can be of 1535 kilowatt per meter square so it means that radiation existence is a function of temperature and of course with the material another important factor in the radiation is is the emissivity and this emissivity term is defined as the fraction of radiant power for a real body which is emitted from the surface with respect to total power and it is referred as the black body radiations and this black body radiations depends both temperature and the nature of emitting surface. So, once you have there is another term which is called as E radiance. So, it refers to uh, a uh, the because when you say view this radiation we can say there is a cavity as if there is a cavity a small cavity which um, radiates and that means which have enough radiant power and radiation is uh, comes out of it and that term is called E radiance. When, uh, uh, when the radiate existence of a black body it occurs at the uh, same temperature. For example, there are two bodies one is black body which has certain temperature T we found its radiant power. There is a, uh, another body which is not a black body and if you want to ca calculate its radiant power at same temperatures then that term we will call as E radiance. To quantify this the first concept that was introduced is Kirchhoff's law which says that radiant power or radiant mode of heat transfer dq by dt is equal to A epsilon times T radiant power of black body at temperature Tw and radiant power uh, of um, black body at any temperatures. So, this particular expressions was bit complicated and further it was simplified by using Stephen Boltzmann's law where this radiant power was quantified as, uh, as proportional to the temperature to fourth power of the temperatures. So, we can write rewrite this Kirchhoff's law as Stephens Boltzmann's law and which is most widely used as of now which is says that dq by t dt is equal to a times epsilon sigma into t w to the power 4 minus t, t to the power 4, where epsilon is emissivity, r is the radiant existence, a stands for the area of non black body and here it is introduced a term which is called as Stephens Boltzmann constant. So, with this I have uh, come to the end of this particular lecture where we have introduced the important concept work, heat, internal energy and subsequently formulation of first law. So, the first law gives the indication of internal energy enthalpy and the quantification of internal energy as a function um, the functional form of internal energy uh, can be evaluated from the first law mathematically. So, now we will move try to solve some very basic problems uh, uh, as far as the work transfer and heat transfer is concerned. So, the first problem concerns about a kind of a situations 
when there is a change in the um, velocity and this change in the velocity is associated with the change in the kinetic energy and that how that kinetic energy can be related to work transfer thermodynamically. So, the first problem says that we have to calculate the power required to accelerate a 900 kg car to a speed of 80 kilometers per second in 20 seconds. So, it is initially the we can imagine that the car is at rest. So, V 1 is equal to 0 and V 2 is 80 kilometer per hour and this can be changed to uh, meter per second that is 80 into 5 by 18 meter per second. So, this turns out to be 22.2 meter per second. And the rate of change of kinetic energy we say it is power this W A you can write half m v 2 square minus v 1 square and v 1 is 0 here. So, this turns out to be half into 900 into v 2 square which 22.2 into 22.2. So, this turns out to be 222 kilo joule and this much power we have to this much work we have to use in 20 seconds. So, power requirement P A would be W A by T time. So, 222 by 20 so it is 111 kilo joule. Per second or kilowatt. There is something wrong, so this number would be, so this number would be 11.1 1 kilojoule per second. So it will be 22.2. So PA would be 11.1 kilowatt. And in the second problem the car is going to climb. This climb means with an and this angle is taken as 25 degree. So, your movement is in this directions. So, vertical is V vertical speed of these things and we have horizontal speed. So, we can rewrite this equation that when the car is climbing in a slope road at an angle 25 degree with same condition as the question 1 and the velocity of the car is to remain constant, then we can put the power requirement as W B and that is nothing but M G times B vertical, vertical velocity of the car that is M G vertical velocity will be V sin 25 degree. So, W B one can quantify mass is 900, G is 9.81, velocity is 22.2 because we are not going to change the velocity and sin 25 degree. So, this term would be, so this term would be 76 point 36 kilowatt. Okay. So, the next problem is uh, about the uh, uh, heat transfer. So, we are looking at a person who stands in a bridgy room means it is a there is a breeze of wind with, uh, and this wind room is maintained at 20 degree centigrade we have to calculate the heat transfer if the if the exposed surface area and surface of the outer area temperature is 30 degree centigrade. Now, here the first thing that you need to understand is that what are the possible mode of heat transfer from the person. So, the possible mode of heat transfer we can write Q as Q convection is possible plus Q radiation is possible. Now, uh, Q convection requires 
h a delta t and delta t is known here uh, 30 minus 20 10 degree centigrade area is 1.6 meter square and here we have to assume for convection heat transfer coefficient so this a typical number can be 6 watt per meter square for this kind of situations so this number i have assumed uh, maybe uh, uh, for a normal temperature uh, bridge wind natural convection value the h can be of this number so q convection can write 6 into area is 1.6 delta t is 10 so q would be 96 watt that is convection other part of radiation you can quantify as sigma epsilon a t uh, 1 to the power 4 minus t to the power 4. So, if I say t 1 as 30 degree centigrade, so it will be 303 Kelvin, t 2 20 degree centigrade, it is 293 Kelvin, sigma value can be assumed as 5.67 into 10 to the power minus 8 watt per meter square into Kelvin to the power 4, epsilon for a room a realistic number could be 0 0.95 that means for a human body the emissivity term is a of this number, area is again 1.6 meter square. So, by putting this we can, can quantify radiation heat transfer as 66 watt. So, you can say uh, that total heat is 96 plus 66 162 watt and of course, this number is very uh, small which we normally do not realize, but still the convection and radiation heat transfer at room temperature is possible. So, with this I conclude this presentation today, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.